Okay, let's go on. Because I think there's a second set of problems. We live in a culture that in many ways denies death. It escapes from it, it hides from it, it sanitizes it. I grew up in the 50s when wakes were held in the home. Often when relatives came from Boston, I'd have to sleep on the couch in the same room as the coffin. You know, you didn't sanitize death because most people died at home. Now that's all radically changed, and you know, and I'm not saying let's go back to that, but what I'm saying is we have developed a culture that hides the reality of death in many ways. Um, I, I have a friend who's a priest and he, he gets very upset about this and when his grandmother died, his aunt was standing with him next to the coffin and she looked at him and said, and you know, they're looking at her body and, and his aunt says to him, my Lord Basil, doesn't she look good? How does she look to you? And Basil said, dead. <laughs> That cut to the chase pretty quickly. <laughs> In a sense, there is a danger here with funeral liturgies that we tend to too quickly become a resurrection people. As if fear, anger, doubt, and grief should be masked at the liturgy of funerals and that the task of the funeral is therapeutic so that we heal the business of fear, anger, doubt, and grief. Certainly, it should not find expression. There are many people who believe this. Um, I, I guess part of it is, for some of us in our tradition, like I grew up in a time when, my Lord, if you dear, ever said something that sounded like a criticism of God, if the thunderbolt didn't come through and get you directly from God, Sister Patronella took care of it. <laughs> but, you, but if you look at the Jewish tradition, they have a wonderful tradition of lament. Think of Fiddler on the Roof, when he's in the barn and he's, everything is falling apart. And that wonderful moment when he looks skyward and says, I know we are the chosen people, thank you, now go pick on somebody else. <laughs> it's a wonderful lament. We, for example, our language, we many times now, we refer to the Mass of the Resurrection. The Mass of the Resurrection is the name given to the Mass of Easter Sunday. That's the Mass of the Resurrection. We celebrate the Mass of Christian burial. Language is important here. The Mass of Christian burial. I have a good friend who is a clinical psychologist, and for years in one parish where I worked, she facilitated the bereavement support group and did wonderful work, a, a woman of great competence but also of great compassion and spirituality. And when I saw her in the first year after I went home on vacation from Ottawa, and she looked terrible, and I, in order to be, start the conversation, I asked her how the bereavement support group was going, and she said, I can't do that at the moment, I can't. And that's when I found out that her husband had dropped dead at the breakfast table several months earlier. And then she said something that is so profound. She said, you know, Bill, I know that over the years I helped many people through the journey of bereavement because I knew a lot about grief. But she said, by God, now I don't know much about grief, but do I ever know grief? And there's a difference between knowing about and knowing. And if you look at scripture, the kind of knowledge that scripture deals with, it's not just knowledge between the ears and the head, it's knowledge in the heart. And you don't know grief till you stand by the coffin of one you have loved. And so when, you know, here again, music is crucial. I refer again, however, to that tightrope I mentioned last night between legalism and pastoral sensitivity. Well, also here with music, liturgically, there's a tight rope as well. We can't sing only joyful resurrection songs. We can't exclude them, but we can't sing only joyful resurrection songs. Because that contributes to that stark escapism from death, masking it. On the other hand, we can't resort to maudlin, tear-jerking stuff. There's a tightrope to be walked here. 
Again, I quote Richard Rutherford. He says, in some ways, the task of the liturgical, uh, of the liturgical musician is almost impossible. The task of the liturgical musician is almost impossible at funerals. He said, because we operate in that no man's land where we run the risk of creating feelings of either mournful resurrection or even worse, glorious grief. Mournful resurrection or glorious grief. The funeral liturgy and its music is not meant to deny death and its pain. It is not an insulation therapy. It is rather a faith-filled confrontation with the mystery of death and the unknown. A faith-filled confrontation. And it requires a pastoral sensitivity that recognizes that separation takes time. We need to know that you cannot possibly go from bone-numbing grief to resurrection joy with one song. It takes time. Resurrection theology must not ignore or deny the pain of death. I, this doesn't involve music, but you know that expression, beware the anger of a patient man? <coughs> well, I, as a young priest, worked with one of the most patient priests and patient human beings I've ever encountered. And he was so incredibly gentle with people in all circumstances. And the only time I saw him lose it was when we went to the home of a woman whose husband had died very suddenly and tragically. And she was just gone with grief. And again, like the funeral I mentioned last night, this one was near Christmas. Her neighbor, who had just joined, and I want to be very careful, I don't want to offend people, but she had just joined one of these evangelical groups where he's, you know, oh, let's sing for joy, he's gone home to God, you know. And the neighbor comes in with the best of intentions and starts laying this guilt trip on the woman. Why are you crying? Don't you know he's spending his first Christmas in heaven? You should be singing thankful hymns. And she went on like that for a few minutes, and you could just tell that the woman was about ready to explode. And with that, this elderly priest got up and gently took this woman by the arm towards the door and said, I want you to go home now, dear. This lady needs to be alone for a while. N are you denying the Christian faith that he's spending his first Christmas in heaven? And he looked at her and he said, no, I'm not denying that. But if you don't leave now, you're spending Christmas with him. <laughs> There's the tightrope. We profess resurrection. We profess the victory of Christ over death. But we also acknowledge people's grief and pain and the sense of loss. And separation takes time. How do we do this musically? One of my favorite pra phrases in the Eucharistic prayer is the phrase, the hope we cling to the hope we cling to. Neither resurrection joy nor unassailable grief is the chief motif of the rite of Christian funerals. The defining motif of the funeral liturgy is hope. It's hope. The hope we cling to. Not the kind of hope that says, I hope I win a lottery or I hope things work out or an assessment of the circumstances and say things are looking more hopeful. Not that kind of hope. Christian hope, which is based on the person of Jesus Christ. We often speak of our commitment to God, but a funeral, more than any other time, should proclaim God's commitment to us. God's commitment to us. We come together to celebrate our faith in eternal life, yes, but also to strengthen the hope we cling to, and music often gives voice to the unspoken meanings which are so important at this time. And it requires great pastoral wisdom and sensitivity in the choice of music. I am the resurrection and the life may be an absolutely wonderful selection for a 90-year-old who died peacefully in his sleep, but it may break the hearts of the parents of an infant. 
when we are selecting music, oh, so often as a pastor I would hear, I would see someone leave church, let's say a month after the funeral, and I'd go visit them, and I'd say, what happened? They sang that hymn that they sang at his funeral. I couldn't handle it. Anybody ever hear that? But I've also heard the opposite. I've heard people say to me after Mass, thanks for using that hymn this morning. They used it at her funeral. It's, see, here we're into the unknown. Here we are into individual reactions and circumstances, and we are so much here into the unknown. And we, therefore, pastoral sensitivity and wisdom requires a number of questions. Number, keep the circumstances in mind, the age of the person, the circumstances of the death. A 90-year-old peacefully in sleep is very different from a murder victim, a suicide, or an accidental death of a 16-year-old. Keep in mind the circumstances. I, I will never forget being at the funeral, a memorial service of one of the victims of Swiss Air crash in Nova Scotia back in 1998. And the selection was, I will raise you up on eagle's wings. It was the most inappropriate thing. But it was a very popular hymn at that time. But you should have seen that family. Where the hell was he when we needed those eagle wings? It, was a, it didn't work, folks. Other circumstances, the size of the assembly. And as we were talking earlier, ecumenical consideration. Tunes that are known by all. And therefore, we have to be flexible according to the circumstances.